such a beautiful day. It's just a gorgeous turnout here. We thank you so much for attending. Thank you very much. I am Randy Lehman, retired United States Air Force. I'll be your host for today. I'd like to talk just briefly about veterans. Veterans Day annually falls on November 11th. Most of you know this is the anniversary of the signing of the armistice, which ended World War I hostilities between the Allied nations and Germany in 1918. On Veterans Day, we pay tribute and honor all veterans for their service in defense of our great nation, the good old United States of America. Veterans, as you all know, are the quiet type, never one to boast what they did, where they were, not one to stand out and say, hey, look at me, I am a veteran. I would like to briefly tell you about the typical veteran that I read at one time. It was during World War II. This veteran was on a boat that was sunk by the Japanese destroyer. He and others clung to the listing of a hull for over nine hours in the cold water before swimming for a 70-yard wide plum pudding aisle. Despite an injured back, this veteran stayed on course while towing a badly wounded burned crew member by clenching the ties of that guy's life jacket between his teeth. After establishing contact with two native islanders who were working as scouts for the Allies, this veteran persuaded them to deliver a coconut that he had etched an SOS message to the nearest base. Rescue followed two days later. For that heroism, he was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal. When asked how he became a hero, he simply quipped, it was involuntarily. <laughs> they sank my boat. <laughs> Of course, I'm talking about the 37th President of the United States, President John F. Kennedy. President Kennedy was a fierce supporter of the military. He established the Navy SEAL in 1962 and authorized to wear the Green Beret as a headgear for the Army Special Forces. It was Kennedy's military service and his tragic death that gave the full meaning to his famous inaugural declaration. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. This is a true example of the typical veteran we know today. I found this article in the American Legion magazine, November 2014, titled Americans Most Beloved Veterans. For those of you that can stand, I ask you to stand now for a few uh, pledge of allegiance and then ask why I if you We are reminded that because of their service, we can live in 
blessing on the lives of those who have served our nation, those who are still alive having served our nation. We pray that their days will be rich and full and they will be acknowledged for their service, not just every November 11th, but every day. Lord, we are aware that those there are veterans who are serving our nation. Who came to us to support us today? 
from the Marine Corps League out of Carlisle. Sergeant the Arms, Bob Gilbert. Fate would have it, Kenny's banner was here, 
right on the end of Parsonage Street, the street I grew up on. Kenny and I became friends as members of the high school baseball team. He was a senior and I was a freshman. I was a backup third baseman and Kenny played center field because he was fast and he had to knack at catching anything that was hit near him. Kenny loved baseball and he worked hard at being a good player and he never seemed to let anything get him down. Unbeknownst to him, he became my mentor, encouraging me at every opportunity. My Uncle Lynn was shot hunting deer in December 1965 and he died on Christmas Eve. He was 15 and I was 14. He was my best friend. I had a real hard time dealing with his death and Kenny helped me in small ways to deal with my loss. We'd win, we did win many games on the baseball team that year. I would cherish the bus rides home from the away games. I'd always try to sit near Kenny. And if we lost, the bus was quiet for a while. You guys in blues, you know what that's all about. <laughs> then Kenny would say something funny and the ice would be broken. After he graduated that year, I never saw him again. Sergeant Kenneth Lee Dever was killed in action in Vietnam in February 1968. At the age of 20, I had a difficult time dealing with his death. He was, I know he loved his country and was doing his job to the best of his ability. He was the kind of guy that you would want by your side when you went into battle. He will never know how much his great work ethic and caring attitude had affected me in just a short period of time. I want, I want to honor him today by encouraging you to pass these attributes on to others. I also want you to pray for the families of all veterans, past and present, who have to deal with the absence of their loved ones. They worry constantly about them and also have to carry on the duties at home. For those who have lost loved ones, there's a huge hole in their hearts that will never be filled. The second veteran I want to talk to you about today is James M. Hawker. He couldn't grow up in the Newville area in the late 50s or 60s without hearing the name Hawker being spoken. Kurt, Judy, Jack, Jim, Jeff, and Joey were active in the community. Jeff and I were friends, so I got to know the family by visiting their home occasionally. Kurt was my little league manager for a couple years, and you could find the boys at the little league field for many of our games. In the spring of 1966, I heard that Jim was drafted and went into the Army. When I found out he was in Vietnam, I decided to write him. As a boy of 15 at this time, my first thought was, what am I going to say? When I thought it over, I decided I was going to talk about one of his teams that he really didn't like a lot, the Phillies. <laughs> so I talked to him about the Phillies, the weather, the high school sports teams, and what was going on in my grandfather's farm, where I lived. He would tell me routinely how bad the weather was and how hard it was to keep things dry. He also mentioned his M16 required cleaning often. He never told me if he killed anybody, and I never asked. He would just say they were in some fierce battles and never went into any detail. He did tell me one time that he had lost some close friends in battle. Over that year of writing to him, I felt like he was sharing his experiences with me as a big brother. After Jim completed the first of three tours in Vietnam, February of 1967, I didn't see or talk to him again until Veterans Day in 1974. After talking to him for a while, I realized this was not the same guy I knew and wrote to several years before. He seemed distant, distant and somewhat agitated. I found out later that he was pretty upset with the way our country treated him and other women returning from Vietnam. He developed PTSD and had a problem with alcohol. He seemed to have a problem finding his place in society. He developed cancer 
both by Agent Orange in 2009 and passed away in January 2010. I will always remember the letters we shared and his big brother mentoring that brought comfort to him when I was dealing with the death of my uncle. Jim loved his country as evidenced by his three tours in Vietnam. His death due to Agent Warren's at the age of 63 is not new to many in our area. I know that at least 10 new area of Vietnam War veterans in their 50s and 60s that have died of cancer, leukemia, or Alzheimer's in the past five to seven years, most all likely caused by Agent Orange. Although it has been two years since the VA finally recognized Agent Orange as a cause of death for Vietnam veterans, I continue to hear that the VA is still rejecting veterans' claims for compensation. This is unacceptable. We must demand the VA give the necessary care and compensation to our veterans or their families that are left behind. We cannot allow our government to forget the sacrifices our veterans have made. Sometimes God puts people in front of us to help us deal with situations in our life. I believe that he brought Ken and Jim into my life, albeit for a short period of time, to help me deal with the loss on my own. I can only hope that our friendship had an impact on their lives as it did on mine. The third veteran I want to talk to you about today is my dad, Thomas W. Griffin. He was a quiet man, he loved, like all good fathers, loved his family. After the war, he found work at the shoe factory in Carlisle and got a job at the Letter County Army Depot. He worked his way up to mechanic where he up to mechanic where he was responsible for refurbishing the turns on the tanks. He worked hard and a lot of the time worked overtime to provide for his growing family. He didn't we didn't go on vacation and the first we traveled on a regular basis was to Bedford, 